Today we are so excited to have Dr. Francesca Gino here joining us. She is um, a behavioral scientist and the Tandon Family Professor of Business Administration at HBS, Harvard Business School. And she will be talking to us about some of her recent research, which is also um, represented in her new book called Rebel Talent. And I'm told that one of the rebels she'll be talking about is a fabulous Italian chef, so among others. So we have lots of good stuff in store. So Francesca, come on up. Um, she's going to talk for about 45 minutes. Thank, Thank you. you. 45 minutes of content and save your questions. Um, if you're on the live stream, please feel free to ping them to Al-Rahim Morali, whose LDAP is A-L-R-A-H-I-M. And we will go from there. Perfect. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much for all of you to uh, show up and come to the talk. As you heard, we're going to talk about some of the ideas in the book. And I want to share some stories, a little bit of the research behind the scenes. And hopefully, you're going to feel as inspired as I felt when I was working on this book project. Now, I want to start with a story that I heard and I was told by going back to the restaurant by the person who works at these three Michelin star restaurants in Italy. It's called Ostria Francescana. They are in Modena. Um, and his name is Giuseppe Palmieri. And this is actually the story of a family of four who visited the restaurant on a Friday night. So imagine a father, a mother, an eight-year-old boy, and a 14-year-old boy. And Palmieri helps them uh, find their table and then shows up to take the order. And the father, incredibly happy, makes an order for each one of the four of them for a tasting menu that has 13 dishes and it's called Sensations. And it's almost lunchtime, so I want to give you a sense <laughs> of the type of dishes that are part of this menu. So quite creative in the way they're assembled. That's eel. Another dish that is part of this 13 um, <laughs> tasting menu course, tasting menu is the one that you see here. Looks like a funny ice cream, but that's a foie gras. So not the type of dishes that growing boys would hunger for. Now, the father was so eager to eat at the restaurant that not only made the reservations for Friday night, he also made the reservations for Saturday night. So it's now 24 hours later, the same family is back at the restaurant, and Pamiri again welcomes them in, uh, brings them to their table, and then shows up to take the order. This time, again, very happily, the father goes for a 10-course tasting menu called the Tradition in Evolution. And again, I want to give you a sense of the type of dishes that are part of that menu. One of them is called snails under the earth. It's served as a soup, but there are actually snails at the bottom of the plate. And they're hidden under a foam of raw garlic and potato. And the earth part of the dish stands for black truffle, coffee, and nuts. Now, when Palmieri was taking the order, he noticed that the boys almost had a face of desperation. <laughs> as if they were not sharing the eagerness and the excitement of their father to have another gourmet meal. And the boys were keeping quiet, but Palmieri turned to the eight-year-old at the table and said, what would you like to have? Pizza, <laughs> said the eight-year-old boy. Now, as we have just gone, there's no pizzeria. There is no way you could find pizza on their menu, and it's a rather serious place. Fresh flowers are brought into the restaurant every day. The tables are put together with surgical precision. The dishes are arranged with a lot of attention to detail. And this is a restaurant that back in 2016 became the best restaurant in the world. And in fact, also this year, in 2018, they were back at the top of the list. But despite all of that, when Palmieri heard pizza, he excused himself, ran to the phone, called up the best pizzeria in Modena and ordered the pizza. And sure enough, about 15, 20 minutes later, a pizza <laughs> showed up at the door in a taxi and pizza was served to the boys. Now I'm telling you this story because it's a perfect example of what rebel talent is all about. Even in situations where there are lots of rules, as in the case of fancy restaurant, Palmieri was able to keep his mind open. 
look at the problem from a different perspective and come up with a rather creative solution. So what I want to suggest is that we all probably want to be people like Palmieri. If we think about our leadership broadly defined, the people that we influence in our different spheres of life, whether at work or in our personal life, I would say that we want to have people who would order the pizza like Palmieri did in that particular instance. Now what's interesting is that I would call Palmieri a rebel for this behavior, for many other behaviors that he engages in on a regular basis in his work. But rebels usually have a bad reputation. I spend a lot of time in organizations and I've collected all sorts of words for them. They're called the show-offs, sometimes they're called the jerks, or the annoying people who slow you down in your decision-making processes, the troublemakers, the outcasts. In fact, I think that we often have a very precise idea of the rebels in the business. We think about people like Apple visionary Steve Jobs. So people are incredibly innovative and creative, but at least the stories go, not the type of people you want to work with or have as a boss or as an employee. And what I want to do in the time that we have together, and it was a big motivation for writing this book, is try to shift that thinking and suggest that people who I call rebels are not people who break rules just for the sake of breaking rules. They are not people who are arrogant. They are people who break rules, who hold them and others back. And they break rules in a way that is very constructive and productive and positive for their organizations. So as I said, let me share a few stories that are going to allow us to talk about what are the ingredients of their success. And the first story that I want to share comes from the domain of sport. Now, some of you might know this guy is a rather well-known coach. His name is Maurice Cheeks. And I want to tell you in particular about the evening of April 23rd, 2003. This was a big night for him. It was game three of the first round of the 2003 NBA championships. And I'd like you to imagine being there. You're in a very big arena, 20,000 fans ready to watch the game. You're there with them, ready to cheer up your team to success. Millions of viewers from home. And before the game started, a girl who is about 14 years in age stepped into the arena ready to sing the national anthem. And what I'd like you to do is watch a video clip that I brought with me of that moment. And I'd like you to pay attention to what this coach does. Why don't we do the following? Uh, we'll come back to uh, that. And I'm going to talk about a different ingredients first, uh, where we don't need to look at the video quite yet. The second ingredient that seems to be something the rebels do quite uh, well is having a great desire for challenge and for novelty. And I want to introduce this ingredient by telling you about a personal story. It is Christmas time a few years back at our house. And this is not what happened there. <laughs> I had what I thought was the perfect gift for my husband. And the only thing that you need to know about him is that he's the type of person who would be super happy to work here. So he's a complete geek, so always loves the new piece of technology, uh, the latest gadget. Everything that is uh, interesting and playful when it comes to technology is the perfect gift for him. And so on Christmas Day, he runs downstairs. There is a big tree in the living room. And under the tree, he finds a big box that I prepared for him. And he takes the top off. And then he starts taking some pieces of paper out of the box. There was this card at the bottom of the box letting him know that they signed us up for a 10-week, two-hour weeks course in improv comedy. Now, as it turns out, improv comedy taught me all sorts of interesting things that are really good lessons for life in thinking about the work that we do and thinking about the relationship that we have. And in the spirit of uh, bringing to bear something that I've learned by taking this class, I thought that we could do an exercise together that is one of the exercises that we did quite a few times throughout uh, improv. Now, um, just to close the story, my, my husband wasn't too happy when I signed him up for this <laughs> class. He really wanted the latest gadget in his hands, but I thought he was wrong. And by the end of the first two-hour class, he actually told me that he hated it. Uh, <laughs> 
But things started to change as we went on and on for our weekly classes. And he started really enjoying having this date with the unexpected. So I'm going to ask each of you, if you don't mind, to stand up for this exercise. I'm going to ask each of you to find a partner. So a person who is standing close to you that would work well. Perfect. And I'm going to put myself up here so that you can see the direction. So this is not too difficult. OK, I'm going to ask you to stand about this distance from your partner. That is uh, somebody over here who needs a partner since you're working in pairs. And if you don't have a partner, you can also work with me. I'm fine with that. OK, so here's what I'm going to ask you to do uh, from that position. You're going to stand in front of your partner. I'm going to ask you to spend the next 20 seconds, and I'm going to keep the time for you, staring in the eyes of your partner, OK? And there are a few more rules before you get started. No laughing, no talking, no anything, no really expression of any emotions on your face, OK? So that's the exercise. As I said, I'm going to keep the time for you. And when there is silence, you can start. And time. <laughs> How did that feel? It was great. <laughs> Your face is like, ah. OK, for some of you, maybe it's slightly awkward, a little bit weird, uncomfortable. As it turns out, if you felt a little bit awkward or slightly uncomfortable, that's OK. It means that you're human. Uh, because our brain knows that if we stand that close to a person looking in their eyes for that amount of time, one of two things usually happen. <laughs> one, we're going to kiss the person. <laughs> two, we're going to punch them in the face. And I, I don't want any of that to happen at Google. So you can go to your partner, shake their hands, and say, I'm not going to punch you. I'm not going <laughs> to kiss you. OK. Now that that is out of the way, no, 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 stand up. <laughs> Not sitting yet. There is a second part to the exercise. Now, a beautiful principle of improv is the idea of always working on scenes with a partner and shifting the attention from us to them. Our goal in scenes is always trying our best to make our partner feel good about what they're doing or feeling a, as confident as they can feel about what they're doing. And again, what a beautiful lesson about <laughs> life more generally. And so to practice that, we're going to go back to the same position. Again, I'm going to ask you to engage in this 20 second of, uh, period of staring. But this time, you're also trying to pay attention. So what is their eye color? Is their haircut an interesting one? Or are their ears shaped in a slightly different way? Whatever you want to do, you're trying to stare, but pay attention to what they're doing. OK, same rules, same rules as before. So not talking, no laughing, no facial expression of any kind. OK? Perfect. If you're ready, let's go. And time. <laughs> OK? We're going to test whether you were paying attention or not. Seems like that you were, I know. Oh, <laughs> that sounds like a comment from my husband as we were going through classes. You're going to turn around 180 degrees, so each one of you. So this time is not your face looking at their face, but it's your back looking at their back. Perfect. And what I'm going to ask you to do is each one of you to think about two big changes. So I don't know, if you have glasses, you might want to take your glasses off or rough up your hair. Be as creative as you want to be. And then make those two changes on yourself, OK? No taking off clothes. <laughs> Just perfect. OK, if you have your two changes, 
When you're ready, you can turn around and each of you can guess the changes that you see in your partner. Were you able to figure them out? Yeah? Again, it's quite nice to be able to shift the attention from ourselves to the other partner. So hopefully most of you were able to see the changes the other person actually made. Now I'm going to do a final part of this exercise. And do we have music? Are we good with audio? Yeah? Perfect. Okay, we're going to do the final part of the exercise. And this is what I'm going to ask you to do, if you don't mind. Um, do you like to dance? Yes. Yes. Oh, if I were to find you on a dance floor, what you would be doing? Dancing. Okay, can, you show, can you show me one of your moves? Uh, yes. I generally have like... You have generally... Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. This is what I am seeing. So it's something. I'll, sorry, I, I, it's much better than what I'm doing, but it's something around that. Okay. So your role as and again, each of you is going to do this in the pair. Each of you is going to think about their favorite dance move, and I'm going to put on some music and ask you to actually try it out in front of your partner. And then you're going to switch when I say switch. But here's the very important role of the partner. Since your task is to make your partner feel as good as they can feel about their dancing in this case, or as confident as they can feel about their dancing, you're mirroring but exaggerating, okay? So whatever it is, I don't know what I would do this here, but in a way that really makes them feel good about the way they're dancing, okay? Um, as I said, I'm going to put up some music since it's easier to dance that way. You can decide who's going to go first. <laughs> And when you're ready, the first person can start. Take a seat. <laughs> Some really exceptional dancing in this room. I have to say, I'm very, I'm very impressed. How did that feel compared to the first exercise when you were staring the first time you did that? Much better, right? It's interesting that once we put ourselves out there in situations where we feel challenged, where we're always doing something new, it becomes easier to feel comfortable with the uncomfortable. That's what rebel often do. Now, I was obviously very interested in studying this idea in the case of businesses. And so I went to businesses to try to see how is it that they injected this idea of challenge and novelty in the work that people do. And one of the businesses I visited, where I expected not to find any rebelliousness, is a fast food chain in the middle of Tennessee and West Virginia. They look like this. They're drive through big blue boxes with french fries and hot dogs on their roof but they're quite successful at what they do in fact if you look at any measure of performance revenue per square you name it they beat the competition by far and we're talking about big brands like mcdonald's burger kings wendy's now they also invest in people quite differently so if at a place like mcdonald's you receive 
an hour and a half, two hours of training per stations. At PALS, they give you 135 hours of training per station. So they're really all about making you an expert such that you have the free space in your mind to think about how to improve on the work that you do. Now, when I was there, I was in the middle of the store actually at rush hours, and so you see people working at their stations almost like machines. And I started thinking that maybe work becomes monotonous or even boring. And yet the general managers have thought about this. And so in small ways that they inject novelty. One way in which they do this is that the idea of um, letting people know the order that they're going to follow throughout the day, the stations that they're moving from to when they show up for work. So they create a little bit of unpredictability, a little bit of novelty that allows them to stay on their feet. And what's also interesting is that they have all sorts of challenges for the people working in the stores. My favorite to date is a challenge for the person working at the windows, so the person who takes the order. An interesting statistic about PALS is that they have a lot of repeat customers, so people who eat there five to six times a week. And they have a simple menu, and so people are creatures of habit tend to make the same order whenever they show up. And so the challenge for the person at the window was if you can remember 100 orders in a row, then there is this reward. And it was really interesting to see how the person really experienced it as being pushed in the work that she did. And uh, she was very happy when she actually completed the challenge successfully. So what is very true about Rebel is, is that they have this desire for novelty. They're not afraid of putting themselves in situations that makes them uncomfortable. Now let's go back to the first ingredient with the video that I wanted to show you earlier. So you know the setup. And as I said, the idea is for you to think about how you'd feel if you were in the shoes of this coach. We're going to watch the video, maybe, maybe not, who knows, <laughs> a little bit of novelty, um, and see what he does. Pay attention to his behavior. And now to honor America and salute the men and women serving our country with our national anthem, please welcome, as voted by you, the fans, our winner of the Toyota Get the Feeling of a Star promotion, Natalie Gilbert. question, does this guy have a good voice? <laughs> Absolutely not. And yet it took him no time to step in the middle of the arena and start singing, helping the girl who needed help. What is impressive about him is that he has no problem making himself vulnerable, even when that means showing everybody that clearly singing is not one of his strengths, but rather it's a weakness. And that's what Rebel seems to be doing quite naturally. They make themselves vulnerable in a way that 
is not backfiring as we often think it will, but rather buys them a lot of respect. In fact, if you didn't feel moved in a little way at least of watching that, I think you have no heart <laughs> <laughs> because it really creates an emotional connection by doing what uh, it does. So as I said, rebels are people who seems to be quite uh, happy to jump in and to help. Now, they also are people, as I said, that they have this uh, interesting desire for novelty, but I want to share a couple of more of their ingredients. And again, we're going to go back to the domain of sport. And we're not going to look at this guy <laughs> playing. We're going to see a little boy, a younger boy, getting into the baseball field. And I'd like you to pay attention to the reframing that he does quite naturally. Strike three. Wow. I'm the greatest pitcher in the world. Yes. Optimism. Pass it on. Now, this little guy is very impressive. We all tend to dwell on our weaknesses. We often overinvest in our weaknesses. And instead, he shifts his attention to his strength. And as it turns out, that's what rebels do. They play to their strength on a regular basis. And that's something that makes them feel authentic in the work that they do. Now, I was very curious about this idea of authenticity. There is a lot of talking uh, in the world about the power of authenticity. And I was interested in looking at whether a lot of the things that we say about authenticity are true. And so with my colleagues, we went to all sorts of contexts to look at whether authenticity is, in fact, a powerful driver in the work that we do. So one of the contexts that we explored is entrepreneurial competitions. So imagine entrepreneurs showing up, pitching their ideas to venture capitalists. And what we found is that when entrepreneurs are authentic and genuine in their pitching, they're three times more likely to get money for their ideas. Now, I think this is also an interesting part of the story of the chef and owner of the restaurant that I mentioned earlier, Osteria Francescana. You can see him here. His name is Massimo Bottura. Really interesting person and leader. In fact, he is a person who went to a context, a traditional Italian dishes, and reinvented them. Now, I don't know how much you know about Italians, but there are two things that are very true. One is that there are lots of rules when it comes to cooking, and we cherish our old ways. And he went to a context where there are lots of traditions, where recipes have been passed on for centuries, from generation to generation. And he basically messed up <laughs> the tradition and came up with something new. So he studied traditions very carefully and then started asking questions, well, maybe it made sense um, cooking this dish this way 20 years ago, but not today, let's do something different. So if uh, you have ever had lasagna, this is his version of the lasagna. It's called the crunchy part of the lasagna. It looks nothing like the type of dishes I grew up with. Now, what is interesting is that when you open the restaurant, tradition bound Italians weren't too happy. In fact, he talks about it as actively fighting against him. And when I asked him what allowed him to stay persistent, he told me about the power of authenticity. And in fact, he told me about the story of the summer that he spent at Il Bulli, at the time quite a famous restaurant in Spain, and what he learned from the chef there. And it was really a message of feeling the freedom and expressing the freedom of uh, playing to your strength and staying authentic. And so this is the quote, he said, what changed me was the message of freedom that Ferran gave me, the freedom to feel my own fire, to look inside myself and make my thoughts edible. And sure enough, after the summer, he went back to Modena. He sold everything that he had. 
he borrowed money from his wife's family and then he invested the money and the time in the restaurants, came up with new recipes, and a few months later, the first Michelin star arrived, then the second one, then the third, and as I told you in 2016, the restaurant became the restaurant, the best restaurant in the world. A moment of Italian pride, since it was the first time an Italian restaurant reached the top of the list. Now again, his, interest, his story is interesting, but as a scientist, I was curious to know whether his story is more generalizable. The idea that authenticity is really powerful to help us persist through challenges. So one of the studies that we conducted to look at this is by bringing Red Sox facts into HBS campus. And what we did, we gave them um, one type, one of two types of wristbands to wear. Either the wristband of their favorite team the Red Sox or the wristbands of the New York Yankees. And then we put them through all sorts of challenges in the hour that we had with them. And at the very end, one of the challenges was to ask them to put their dominant hand in a bucket of ice. And so we were paying them the longer they kept their hand in a bucket of ice. We were interested in seeing whether uh, you see persistence, more persistent when people experience authenticity, even in the case of tolerance to pain and physical persistence. And sure enough, across all the different challenges we put them through, people who felt authentic just for wearing the wristband of their favorite team were much more likely to persist through challenges, even when it came to keeping their hands in the bucket of ice at the end uh, of the study, suggesting that authenticity is really quite powerful in helping us resist through challenges. Now, what this tells us, and the reason why I'm telling you these stories, is that they are quite interesting in showing one of the talents the rebels seem to have. There are people who play to their strength quite often, but they also help others do the same. A few years back, I came across a quote of an Italian sculptor and artist that really stayed with me. You probably know some of his work. Um, his name is Michelangelo Bonarotti. Here's what he wrote about the sculpting process. He said, sculpting is a process whereby the artist releases an ideal figure from the block of stone in which is lumbers. To me, that's very powerful because it raises the question of what if we were to look around in our professional lives, at work or in our personal lives and started with the assumptions that fundamentally everybody has talent and that our role as colleagues, as leaders, as parents, as friends is to help them bring those out. So I bought into this idea and then I started questions, uh, asking questions of how do we do that concretely. And so I'm going to leave you with a couple of examples that maybe might trigger some suggestions or ideas in your head. The first story comes from Aerial Investment. This is a Chicago-based money management firm. And the president of Aerial Investment is the woman that you see in the picture. Her name is Melody Opson. Remarkable woman, really successful, uh, really interesting what she does to bring a lot of these talents into her organization. And when I asked her to tell me a little bit more about her career, she told me that she started working at Ariel at the age of 22, right after graduating from college. No working experience. And she's been quite successful. <laughs> so what was the secret to her success? She referred to the advice that she received directly from the CEO at the time on the first day of work. And this is what the CEO told her. You're going to be in rooms with people who have a lot of money and have big titles, but it doesn't mean that your ideas are not as good or even better. I want to hear your ideas. It's incumbent on you to speak up. So from the very first day, she had the license of bringing her contributions forward. And this is advice that she shares with everybody at the firm or everybody that she brings into the firm. Now, back in 2011, I had an opportunity to think about how to apply these ideas. I was working with a company called the Wipro Technologies. They're based in India. And in particular, my colleagues and I were working with their business process outsourcing side of the business. So imagine people working in call centers. Now, as you might imagine, it's a tough job. And in fact, what Wipro was experiencing was investing a lot in people, bringing them in, and then 45 to 60 days into the job, most people were leaving the organization. So not the greatest investment. And so we did an intervention with them 
where we gave people who joined half hour of reflection. We asked them to think about their strengths, to think about what's unique about them and how they could play to their strengths more often at work. And since we wanted to test the ideas, some of the people actually went through this revised welcoming process. Some of them went through the regular welcoming process at Weeper and then we looked at turnover rates seven months after the intervention. And what we found is that this moment of reflections where people had the chance to think about what makes them authentic and how they could bring that out into work was quite powerful. So people were more likely to be with the organization seven months later. They were also much happier in their jobs and they perform better as we know from the ratings on customers' calls. And what is interesting, I think, about this study is that it's in a context where the job is very scripted, suggesting that even there, there is an opportunity for us to rely on these talents. So what these different studies and stories tell us is that rebels play to their strengths on a regular basis, but they also help others do the same. And again, I felt very inspired by learning about this in a way that made me think about work a little bit differently. So let me share a final ingredient and then we're going to open it up for question. This is, a, I think, at the moment one that um, really puzzles me and it's a talent for curiosity. And it puzzles me because we're all born with it. In fact, if you look at the data, curiosity peaks at the age of four and five and then it declines steadily from there. I think that that's a sad finding and a missed opportunity. And I don't know if you can still remember the time you were a kid. It's way too long ago for me. So I think about my children <laughs> who are at the age where curiosity is really coming out. And it's constant questioning. Just before I left for this trip, they were asking questions about why is the sky blue? Or why is it that we need to wear clothes when we leave the house? It's constant exploring and a sense of wonder and questioning. We seems to be losing that. And in fact, when I looked at this in the context of organizations, I looked at people who were starting new jobs across a different set of industries. And it seems like curiosity is pretty high as you start. But when you go back to the same people six to eight months later, curiosity had dropped across the board by at least 20%. It doesn't have to be that way. And in fact, rebels are people who keep their curiosity alive and also encourage it in others. So I'll give you a couple of examples. One comes from Intuit. Every year they have innovation awards. And these are for people who have uh, ran some explorations that led to new products or new processes. But they also have failure awards. And these go to people whose explorations did not end up in a new product, but led to good learnings for the team. And what's most exciting about this example is that the failure awards come with a failure party. So you're really creating an atmosphere where explorations is in fact supported and valued. Now we started with a story about the restaurant Osteria Francescana, so we're going to end with the story about this restaurant. This is a very busy night at Osteria Francescana, and one of their sous chef, that is known internally as Taka, was working on the last dessert of the night, and it was a lemon tart. Taka is known for being <laughs> obsessed with precision and attention to detail, and so he was working very carefully, arranging the different pieces on the plate. And all of a sudden, the plate dropped to the floor, and now you had a smashed lemon tart. Now Taka was starting to panic, trying to understand and figure out what to do. And as he was feeling <laughs> this way, Chef Massimo Bottura walked into the kitchen and saw the plate on the floor. And rather than yelling, as I bet a lot of leaders would do in fancy restaurant, he looked at the plate and said, I think we have a new item for our menu. And sure enough, they came up with a new dessert. It's now one of their most popular desserts at the restaurant. And um, it looks like this. I took a picture when I was there. <laughs> it's smashed on the plate even in the way that it's prepared. And the name for it is, oops, I dropped the lemon tart. <laughs> and it's just a great example of how curious people or curious leaders like him are able to even look at accidents or mistakes and turn them into a source of inspiration. So 
It seems as if these rebels do have a recipe to their success. And if you look at how they use their talents, there are all sorts of behaviors that they engage in on a regular basis. And there are many of them I write about in the book. I just captured a few of them on these slides. And it's not for talking through them, but just to give you the idea that a lot of these things, a lot of these behaviors are not requiring a complete restructuring of the organization or rethinking over what we're doing, but they require some thoughtfulness on our part. Now, this rebel shares five talents, no matter what industry or um, uh, job they do, and we talked about some of them in more detail. They have this talent for authenticity. They have a talent for novelty. Rather than going with the familiar and comfortable, they challenge themselves. They have a talent for curiosity. They have a talent for perspective, a little bit like what Palmieri did when looking at the problem rather than being stuck on the obvious answer. He looked at it from multiple perspectives. And finally, they have a talent for diversity. So they're people who really reject social roles that are passed on to us by society, and they think about surrounding themselves with people who think differently and can challenge their way of thinking. And they really leverage um, differences. So let me stop here. I have many more stories to tell you, but I'm kind of curious to see what questions are on your mind. Before we get into that. Let me just remember or remind you, if you're on the live stream, feel free to ping Al Rahim Morali. So he's A L R A H I M at. We can start with the room. Uh, Jessica, thanks for that. Oh, thanks for that great talk. Um, I'm just curious. So the literature on creativity shows that people are most creative under some level of constraint. Total mm -hmm. freedom is not great for the creative process. Similarly, do rebels depend on there being some shared assumptions for them to question and break to some extent? And does that mean not everyone can be a rebel in an organization, right? There has to be some kind of you know, shared culture or structure or something like that for them to operate best. Mm -hmm. So uh, in one of the chapters in the book that comes a little bit later, I talk about the principles that rebels live by. And it was something that was inspired by uh, going potentially to a strange place. So one of the organizations that I studied as I was working on this book was pirate ships in the 16th century. They're fascinating, and I had all sorts of wrong ideas about them. And the ships, the crews actually had principles that everybody agreed upon before they left for, a, uh, for their journeys. And similarly, uh, rebels have <laughs> principles. One of them is finding freedom in constraint. So you're right in saying that the fact that, that um, there are structures, norms, rules allows them to bring out some of their creativity. Now, to your question of uh, does that mean that that affects the number of rebels that we have in the organization, I usually receive the question in the form of what's the exact percentage of rebel that I should have in the organization? And my answer is always the same. It makes people feel uncomfortable. It's 100%. And the reason is that if you look at these talents, there is nothing threatening about them other than requiring a little bit more openness to people that bring into work different perspectives. And one of the things that is true about rebels is that you get to being more innovative, to perform better in your job, to have better relationships at work because you're fully engaged in the work that you do. And so I've been struck by the data that um, is very well known about engagement across the globe. And the fact that there are two thirds of workplaces full of people who are disengaged or actively disengaged is just puzzling and strange. And I've met some of those people and really the experience is that work sucks for many of them. And so I think that by encouraging rebelliousness, you also get the engagement that leads to all sorts of benefits. So 100%. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, rebels play to their strengths. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to ask a question related to growth mindset and fixed mindset. Mm -hmm. um, so if they're playing to their strengths, does that mean that they're not improving or building on their weaknesses? And do you think then, uh, wondering if you think then that it's like not useful to do that? 
and just like focus on building more strength. Yeah, so I actually think that if you look at the two talents that I talked about, uh, capture this idea of, of learning and growing. So novelty means putting yourself out there in situations that challenge you in a way that allows you to develop new skills. And so that's the part of the growth mindset. But there is also this idea that you focus a lot of what you do on what gives you energy. That is what I mean by playing to your strengths as a way that makes you feel authentic. So I don't see the two in contradictions. It seems like rebels do both quite, uh, quite well. And one of the things that across the board, um, I don't use the, the label growth minders as much, but I use uh, thirst for learning, which in a sense it's, it's similar, and this uh, willingness to grow in their job is, is quite important for rebels. In fact, some people say, what about arrogance? Where well, arrogance is not part of their playbook, but humility is. Um, I'll give you a quick story if you don't mind. And it's in one of the chapters where I talk about perspective. The person I mentioned there uh, that really surprised me is a captain that you probably all know, and is Captain Sally Sallenberger. This is the captain who ditched the plane with 155 passenger in the Hudson River back on a cold evening of 2009. And when I found myself reading the accident report, I was amazed by what he did. He had 208 seconds to make a decision. So that's the time that he had when he discovered that there was no thrust in the engines and the time he ditched the plane in the Hudson River. Most of us, under such time pressure <laughs> and stress, would narrow our thinking and options. He instead was broadening his perspective. He kept considering what it is that we could be doing. And I reached out to him since I was curious about his approach. And what I've learned is that by the time the accident happened, he had a ton of experience, over 30,000 hours of flying under his belt. He has served in the military, so he had all sorts of experience flying all sorts of planes. He had served as a volunteer in previous accidents, so he knew a lot about what can go wrong. But every time he walked into the cockpit, he would ask himself what it is that could be different in this case, what it is that I could learn. And so he kept that intellectual humility that I've seen a lot of rebels that allows them to keep looking at their experience as a signal, not that they know it all, but that there is more to grow and learn. We have a question from the live stream. Most of the examples you shared involve men as rebels. Mm -hmm. How do you think that rebellious behavior is treated when those rebels are outside of the gender or ethnic majority? Uh, very good point, and I tried um, in the book to actually be much broader in the sense of um, not only going outside of the United States, but also having both examples of men and women as well as different uh, groups. Now, what I collected some data on this, since one of the questions that I always receive is, can uh, women or minorities break rules as much as uh, white men? And the answer is that we perceive they can't. But actually, the benefits of embracing these talents are equal for men and women and for all sorts of groups, which I think is quite refreshing. Um, for gender more specifically, I ended up, after the book came out, I ended up um, writing a blog post for HBR where I talk specifically, drawing on a chapter in the book on gender issues and sort of giving tips out of the book of why is it and how is it that women can uh, break rules. But yeah, so we have the perception, but it's the wrong perception, and we can all uh, break rules equally. I think we have time Within for one more. Within the legal line. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. I'm curious about the downsides of being a rebel. Mm -hmm. uh, so all the examples you give are about the upsides and the rewards, but obviously there's a lot of inherent risk as you make yourself uh, more known, take bigger risks, mm -hmm. make more decisions. So what research have you done in that area? So part of it is the fact that you're pushing for something different. And so uh, I think the case of Botur is a great example where you might fight, have to fight some resistance uh, before getting accepted. But in terms of when is it that they could really go wrong or when the costs are really high, I think that for that, it happens for rebels that are not effective. And what I mean by this is that often, especially in organizations where you feel 
that maybe the top leadership is not supporting this approach, people get frustrated. And that frustration often turns into the wrong delivery as you're trying to use this talent. I'm gonna give you a concrete example. So after the book came out, a student of mine wrote me in a message and said, I saw the book, I bought the book, I read the book, I think that you need to change your subtitle. I was like, okay, it says why it pays to break the rules <laughs> at work and in life, and we're scientists, so I obviously always wanna learn and I might be wrong. <laughs> um, so I called them up and we had that conversation for two hours and I, basically his argument was, I'm the perfect rebel based on your descriptions, but things are not working out for me. And from what he was saying, I couldn't quite figure it out. And as it turns out, his job is right outside of Boston. So I said, why don't I come for three days and follow you at work? Like a neutral observer in the background. And I thought it would be a great experience for me just to learn about his approach. And after the first half a day, I was like, OK, I get it. And it was the delivery that was wrong. I think it was really frustrated by what the top leadership was encouraging. And so he was using a lot of arrogance. So, so for example, in a meeting, this was, this was just priceless. Um, the group was talking about a decision that the company was considering. And everybody who talked before him was agree on the fact that there was a right approach of looking at this decision. And he was raising his hand, he was super angry, and then when he got called on, he said, I understand what you all said and why you might think that way, but it's actually the wrong way of approaching the decision. In fact, I cannot even think of an even more wrong way of looking at the decision. What I suggest we do instead, and then he blurred out his answer, and it was just, um, in between crying and laughing and seeing that because the approach was wrong. So I think that that's often when things get um, a little bit difficult for people and they encounter costs. Great, thank you. I'm sure we have a lot more questions, but um, unfortunately we are out of time, so. I'll leave you with that. Yes. So that if you have extra questions, you should feel free to reach out. I'll also leave you with the following thing. Some of you might um, feel maybe not at ease with the idea. And so to get started on this wonderful journey, you might wanna go to the book website. It's called rebeltalents.org. And there is a little test that tells you which type of rebel you are. So which type of talents come more easily uh, or less easily to you. And so you're gonna receive some tips. And if you come out as a pirate, it's a good thing. <laughs> it's actually quite a very good thing. So thank you so much for Thank you so uh, much for, for being, being here. here. Thank you.